Okay, so today we are going to talk about the one and only Citizen Kane. This film is extremely influential in terms of American and international filmmaking. Um, it is oft referenced in American pop culture, so you will start seeing this movie everywhere after you watch it. And um, this is a really divisive film. This is a film that my students and adults that I talk to either love and think is a masterpiece or despise and think is an overrated piece of garbage. And that's kind of the case, I think, with a lot of influential art, right? Um, so it's, it can be easy to take for granted how influential something is um, when it kind of helped to make the form because we are seeing that form, you know, 60, 70 years later as it's become more and more developed. And so those things that at the time were, um, you know, artistically new and innovative and impressive um, might be old hat by the time we're seeing it. Um, a band I think about a lot is like the Beatles, right? A lot of people say they're overrated or whatever, um, but that's because they were really influential on American rock and roll and British rock and roll. And so um, it's like, yeah, they sound really basic and boring, but that's because other people have built off of that. So take that as you will. Historical context is important. All right, so let's talk about Orson Welles. Orson Welles was a young prodigy in the film industry when he made Citizen Kane. Uh, he is a famous auteur, but his start was in acting and directing in theater. And this is in a really important tidbit because he is going to apply that theater experience um, to his work as a filmmaker, which is actually going to be a big reason why his art uh, and why, why Citizen Kane is such a, a well-organized um, masterpiece, if you think it is. I like Citizen Kane, but um, you are welcome to disagree with me. Um, so Orson Welles gained a lot of popularity after, um, his radio production of War of the Worlds, uh, which some people blow out of proportion and say there was this whole big, um, national freak out because people thought that aliens were invading. That's not true. Um, there was a small local freak out, but it was not remotely at the scale that people say, um, regarding War of the Worlds. But his greatest legacy to filmmaking and uh, art is definitely, without question, Citizen Kane. So we're going to talk about this guy, William Randolph Hearst. Um, and you might say, what, Rachel, why are we going to this weird old guy? What does he have to do? Well, William Randolph Hearst was the real-life Citizen Kane. And while Orson Welles had to swear that it wasn't about him, uh, William Randolph Hearst um, is very much the model for this film. Uh, Hearst was a media mogul. He owned a lot of different newspapers. He was super, super powerful, super rich. He dabbled in politics a little bit. Um, and he was known for being a bit sensationalist in his newspapers. So he didn't always tell the plain truth. He exaggerated a lot. Um, and he was this sort of larger than life figure. Um, and towards the later years of his life, he drew, he built himself this huge property, Hearst Castle, where he hosted lavish parties uh, for celebrities and um, he, he and his partner's friends. Um, now, this all right now might sound like, oh, yeah, okay. But as we watch the film, uh, you're going to start to see more of it. Now, let me make sure I don't talk about this on a... Okay, I do talk about this on the next slide, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. So if you guys want to watch it, um, I do have a link on Canvas to an episode of Drunk History uh, that talks about the creation of Citizen Kane. I will warn you, there are a few bleeped out swear words, and it does show a man drinking whiskey. Uh, but besides that, it's relatively appropriate. Um, there's not really any sexual content or anything. Um, and it's kind of a funny way of looking at um, how Hearst and Wells interacted around Citizen Kane. So if you'd like to go watch that, you can pause me right here. Okay, I hope, if you, I hope you did watch it. I think it's very funny. I enjoy Jack Black always, so. All right, let's look at the film. Citizen Kane, released in 1941. 
So like I said, this film was based largely on the life of media mogul William Renoff Hearst. So Hearst actually prohibited any mention of the film in his papers. Um, and what was ironic is that, uh, or, or not ironic, but um, what's funny is that this ended up uh, actually becoming an avenue for publicity for, um, for Orson Welles. And even more people saw Citizen Kane because it was this forbidden film. Um, Hearst tried to block it from being uh, screened in theaters. And Orson Welles actually used this uh, to market the film and was like, oh, it's the film Ren you know, Hearst doesn't want you to see. And uh, he would have all these like screenings and tents and like, um, you know, if there were theaters that wouldn't show them, these sort of like uh, black market, like bootleg screenings. Um, and so the film <clears throat> ended up, uh, becoming more popular because Hearst tried to censor Orson Welles. So let that be a lesson to you about censorship. Uh, when you tell people, Americans especially, they can't do stuff, they're going to want to do it even more. <clears throat> so a lot of critics consider Citizen Kane to be the greatest film ever made. I don't know about that, but it's certainly um, innovative and uh, was a huge effect or has had a huge effect uh, on the film industry. Uh, since then, um, he invented a lot of filmmaking techniques and um, borrowed from people that came before him. Uh, D.W. Griffiths, Griffiths uh, who you might recall, directed Birth of a Nation, said that his favorite parts of Citizen Kane were the parts that Wells borrowed from him. Um, and also, this film has um, incredible use of makeup and prosthetics, uh, which is part of why it's told in black and white, even though color is now available, um, because prosthetics at the time were not realistic enough to uh, be passable in color film. Uh, another really innovative and at the time revolutionary thing that Citizen Kane does um, is that it features nonlinear storytelling. So what nonlinear storytelling means is many stories will start at point A and go to point Z through their story, and they will progress in a timeline like that. Whereas Citizen Kane jumps around. So it might start, so it starts at point Z, Kane's death, and then jumps around back to point A, then to point G, then to point T, then to point F. Uh, Excuse me, and it jumps all around the, the, the story. And we will take a look um, at that breakdown. So if you feel a little bit confused while you're watching this film, uh, don't try too hard to focus on it in terms of the plot uh, if you're finding the plot hard to follow. Instead, focus on the characterization of Kane. Focus on, can I help you, sir? Sorry. Uh, the visual elements um, of the film, the camera work that uh, Orson Welles is doing. That's all a lot more important than you, you know, perfectly following the plot. Okay. So we're going to briefly talk about um, this concept called mise-en-scene. And this is something that we will work with a little bit more this semester, but we really get into mise-en-scene uh, in film two. So mise-en-scene is a French term. I would like you guys to... Say out loud, mise-en-scene. I don't care if you look silly. One, two, three, mise-en-scene. I don't want you to hear you say mise-en-scene or mise-en-scene or mise en scene or whatever. It's mise-en-scene. And this uh, phrase actually comes from theater. And the, the theater term is placement on stage. So it refers to, in theater, um, how things are placed on stage and what effect... Um, so it comprises the lighting, the production and set design, the costume design, um, where things are, whether they're upstage or downstage, stage right or stage left, etc. cetera. Um, so mise-en-scene refers to that visual feeling of a film. So it refers to both the overall visual feeling of a film or a director, but it also refers to the individual uh, feeling of a um a shot. So you could take one shot and you could look at it and say, okay, so like this shot we're looking at right now on the screen, um, what's the first thing your eye is drawn to? Well, that's the camera, right? Even though there's a human subject, the first thing you see is the camera. That's the thing that's most in focus. It's center framed. Um, it's black. 
the background is blurred and uh, is not in focus. So obviously they don't want me to pay attention to that. It's just kind of blobs of color. Um, and then the subsidiary focus. So the thing I see next is the actor, Joaquin Phoenix. So I see the character um, who is slightly off center from the camera. So that's how I can tell he's not most important. He's not as sharp um, as the camera. Then I might look at the lighting and say, okay, this is kind of a medium key lighting. There's shadows on his face, but it's not supposed to be super dramatic um, in terms of the lighting and et cetera, et cetera. You could break a shot down to try to figure out what a director is trying to get you to think, feel what the director is trying to say about the characters in that shot. Um, all of that is what comprises mise-en-scene. So let's look at some examples here of mise-en-scene. Um, so I want you guys to take a second to think. I want you to think about what is the first thing you look at in this, uh, in this shot. I want you to think about what are the second things? What's the lighting like? Um, how have they positioned things either in the background or the foreground compared to the character? Uh, what's the color palette like? All of that. And so I want you to pause me here and talk a little, about, a little bit about the mise-en-scene, the composition of this shot. Okay, hopefully you had some good conversation. Um, so let's take a look at the next one. So let's think about the mise-en-scene of this shot. Again, what is the first thing your eye is drawn to? What's the second thing? What is the color palette like? What's in the background, the foreground? Is there a lot of stuff going on in the frame? Is it kind of basic? Um, what are the character's expressions like? These are all parts of mise-en-scene. So go ahead and take a second to talk about that. Okay. Hope you paused me <laughs> to talk. All right, let's look at the next shot. All right, so now I want you to, again, what is your eye drawn to first? Um, what are the characters doing? Which directions are they facing? What does that tell us about the characters? Um, what are they, you know, what are they surrounded by? What's the background? What are the colors? What do those colors signify to us? Etc. What is this shot trying to tell us about these characters? All right, go ahead and pause me. Okay, hopefully you had some good convo. Is this our last one? Yeah. All right, so this is our last shot we're going to look at. So again, let's think about the mise-en-scene of this shot. What's the first thing your eye is drawn to? The second thing, what's the color palette? What's the lighting like? Don't worry about using fancy film terminology. You can just, you can say, you know, it's dramatic or there's a lot of light and shadows. You don't have to use a fancy word. Let's go ahead and pause me here and talk about the mise-en-scene. Okay. And when discussing mise-en-scene, you can also just talk about things you notice. You don't have to say like, um, you know, like I said, something fancy and intellectual. You can look at it and say like, okay, the computers look kind of 60s-ish or um, there's like this sickly green tile uh, or the blue of her skirt really stands out. You don't have to like have a bunch of like big brain thoughts <laughs> about it. Okay. So as we're watching Citizen Kane, um, I wanted to tell you some things to look for in terms of uh, the mise-en-scene. Um, so the first is camera angles. So Orson Welles uses a lot of creative camera angles. He uses low angles um, and, and he uses a lot of extreme low angles to create meaning. Um, he would actually, like in many cases, he would dig out uh, a hole in the floor for the camera so that he could get an extreme low angle on a subject. Um, Wells also uses lighting to create mood and symbolism. Um, so pay attention to the lighting in these scenes. Um, and uh, he also uses background, mid-ground, and foreground. So uh, imagine that each shot is a stage that's divided into three parts. So you have what's in the very back, you have what's in the middle, and you have what's in the front. So again, you're imagining that this is a 3D image, a 3D space that you're looking at. So for example, in this one, the background is just a fancy dining room. The mid-ground, we have Kane and his uh, wife. But in front of Kane, in the foreground, we have this dining table. 
And that's to show us that Cain is cut off from other people. He's removed. He's put obstacles between himself and the public or between himself and his wife in this case. There's a very literal obstacle, this humongous table. Um, and this is going to make sense when you see the montage that this is part of. So these are the things that I want you guys to think about during this film. Um, like I said, this film might be a little challenging for some of you because of the nonlinear storytelling. Um, so don't, you know, become stressed or freak out uh, if you're having a hard time following it. We are going to do a post analysis for this film. So after we watch the film, uh, we're going to um, talk about it and analyze it together before we move on to the assignment. Um, so if you leave and you're just like, I have no idea what, what, what's going on and I feel personally victimized by Orson Welles, um, don't worry. <laughs> we will talk about it together. Just focus instead on the experience and just noticing things about how Welles shoots the film, the actors' performances, how they're placed, the mise-en-scene. Okay. Uh, with no further ado, uh, you guys are going to go ahead and get into Citizen Kane.